Well, it's starting right now. Hey, welcome everybody uh, to CanJS, uh, not like widgetry number four, I think. Um, there's a few more that I owe everyone, but this time we're gonna do a very special one. It's not just building a regular widget. Instead, it's gonna be building a regular widget with streams. We're not gonna be using uh, define math at all. Uh, no maps of any kind, completely with streams. It's gonna blow your mind. Um, streams are, a, a, I would consider, an advanced topic. They are, you know, not your normal imperative programming. Um, streams are really good to learn. If I, I, I wish everybody knew how to do them. I would build every single guide, I think, at this point in, in CanJS with uh, not necessarily the streams that the way that we're gonna be building things in this example, but with can define stream. Uh, I would definitely be using that for every example if I felt people were you know, all able to understand streams. Um, so this exercise, I think there has like seven different parts, maybe nine different parts, and we're gonna be going through each one, and then I'll, I'll put like a little clock, I'll give people kind of five minutes to try to figure out the solution for themselves. And at the end of five minutes, I'll give the solution, and then and then we'll go on. Um, so this might this will take like an hour and twenty minutes, probably actually. Um, but some of the some of them will go a little bit faster. So with that being said, also um, the, welcome everybody at Patovi who's joined in, in the hangout. Please stop me if there's questions at any moment, because if you have questions, it's almost certain that someone else watching this might have the same question. So this is the credit card uh, guide that we'll be going through. Um, credit card recipe, it's the advanced one. You can find it by going to canjs.com, clicking guides, clicking recipes, and going to credit card guide, guide advanced. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit. So it reads a little bit better. Yeah, so there's nine steps that we're gonna be going through. Um, and I'll talk through those right after we look at what the final example app looks like. Final example app uh, works just like a normal credit card widget, right? If you start entering the numbers wrong, you get some, uh, it'll tell you, and then nicely as you're typing, once you've got it right, it goes back to showing you the right thing. Um, and then once you've put in all of the information, the pay button uh, is no longer disabled, you can click it, it's disabled for about two seconds while the request is being made and allows you to just keep paying a thousand dollars. I did not, although I probably should have, made this actually hooked up to my bank account, and if you put in your real number, it actually paid me every time. Uh, I did not do that, so it is safe to click pay. Um, so the steps that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna set up uh, a basic CanJS application. Um, we're gonna, show how to read the card number with streams, out output the card error with streams, so translate the card number into a, uh, a stream of errors. Then we're gonna make it so really, in some ways the hard part is to make it so, um, how do I run this again? The, in some ways the hard part of this is to make it so we only wanna show the card error once someone has blurred. Right now there's an error, but we don't wanna show people because it would be annoying. Um, but once they've blurred, now forever we want to show the error unless they've put the, uh, that input element into the right spot. So we're going to see how to do that. And that's actually something that can be kind of tricky without streams. Then we're going to do the same thing for the expiration and the CVC code. Then we're going to disable the pay button if any part of the card has an error. Then we're going to implement the payment button. So this is actually the next most complex thing, this is probably the most complex thing. And then we're gonna disable the payment button while payments are pending. So that means like you can't just keep clicking pay um, while the payment is actually pending. So the first thing to do is to clone this JS bin. So to do that, I'm gonna open this JS bin in a new tab and then uh, it's a good idea to log in to GitHub, uh, or through GitHub to JSBin if you've not already. Uh, if you notice, this output is white. I don't know if anybody else is seeing the same thing. That can sometimes happen, at least to me. 
it's because, I don't know, there's a bug in JSBin that I've reported. For some reason, removing the less file, just clearing it out and then adding it right back fixes it. So if you see the same thing, if anybody sees the same thing in Vitovi, give me a thumbs up just because I want to make sure that, okay, so other people are seeing this too. Yeah, there's just a bug in JSBin, I think, with this less for some reason. Um, just cut it and paste it back. It, come, it, it starts working again. Um, and then what you'll see here, oh, also clone. So make sure you clone the, to make your own copy. So I don't have to do the same. Oh, it worked this time. So now I've got my own copy. I've got uh, the HTML for the static widget right here that shows how error messages should be presented and um, how uh, in each of the inputs should be written out to achieve this styling. And then it, this page also loads Kefir. This is Kefir.js. This is the streaming library that we're going to use. It also loads CanJS. CanJS is all with all of its ecosystem extensions, the most important of which being CanKefir that integrates Kefir.js into CanJS. And then uh, Stripe, which we're actually not going to use for this to make the request. I did write it, so if you want to insert Stripe, you could. Uh, you can look at the beginner guide for how to use Stripe. I didn't really want to make this any more complex than I had to by integrating Stripe. Also, Braintree is the Dungeon.js Chicago sponsor, and they are a competitor for Stripe. So use Braintree. Don't use Stripe, everybody. Not, it's a kind of a free plug, but they're a very generous host. So. Um, OK, so any questions before we begin? All right, let's get started. So the first thing is we're going to set up a very basic um, CanJS application, but it's really going to be an alternate form. Uh, I'm assuming when, if, you've, if you're going to about to do this example, make sure you go through the beginner uh, version first, because I'm assuming someone's went through that before attempting this one. Um, so I'm going to use some CanJS lingo that if you've never used CanJS before, you just will not be familiar with. So the big difference is we're going to do the, sim the normal standard CanJS application, which is a template and a view model. But in this case, our view model is just going to be a plain JavaScript object where all properties are going to be kept for streams. Um, and then we're going to render basically this content in a template, but we're going to want to display the pay amount as read from a Kefir property. Now, we'll talk a little bit about Kefir properties versus Kefir streams. You could, Kefir properties and streams are almost identical in every way except for one. So if you hear me say Kefir property, that's the same as a Kefir stream. But essentially what we want is our template to be reading a amount stream, which we'll see that you can do sort of like this. So we're going to want to create a constant Kefir property that is the amount 1,000, because that's how much we're actually going to want to pay, because we're, we're no longer 999. We're using streams, so we're 1,000. So let's learn a little bit about Kefir, um, high-level stuff about streams. So a stream, you could think of it as just, it's, it's just a stream of values. Uh, you can call them events, event streams, right? Um, if you used CamJS before, properties, you can listen to properties when they change. Those are events when the properties change. Kefir is, you could think of it as every value that emits is an event, but it's just any value. It doesn't have like an event object type. It's just any value. So here I can use Kefir to sequentially produce, emit the numbers one, two, and three. So numbers, you could listen to it, and it would just act, Output a one, then a two, then a three every 100 milliseconds. Now, streams is you can do a lot of transformation from one stream to another stream. And that's really what they're about. So here I could transform numbers stream that was emitting a one, two, and three to another stream that's going to emit those values times two. So two, four, and six. In Kefir, there's both streams and properties, as I've talked about. They work almost the same way. 
The only difference is in, with streams, when they emit a value, that value is gone, right? I can't, there's no way of numbers two after it's admitted, or even numbers, after a numbers has admitted the one, but before it's admitted the two, if I were to try to listen, I would not get the one. There's no way to get the one. It's like gone. It, it vanishes right away. Properties are different and they retain their last value after they've admitted it. So you can, you can synchronously get that value by using Keffer's on value method, which we're not really going to be using today, but that's how you can read or listen to the next admitted value. Or if you're a property, get the instantaneous value and then listen to the next change in the value. So to create a constant property, essentially a, a, um, a value, a, a stream that emits a value but retains it but then is done forever, can never change its value, you can use this Keffer constant. So I can create a constant property and then this, I could just read its value and it would always be one. And then... Why would anyone need that? Uh, that's a good question. We will see that later, why someone would need that. Someone's going to need it right now because the amount that we're going to be um, putting in the page is uh, a, actually a constant. It's going to be 1,000. So if you wanted to create a, a readable stream for the view that's 1,000, you could use Keffer constant for now. But we'll, we'll see other uses for constants later. In some ways, this is the most simple string you can have. So can Keffer, which is a package inside CanJS, this exposes uh, to CanStash and to other things. You could con consider it virtual properties on a Keffer object, which is a value and an error key values. This allows in stash to read the stream value and the stream error without having to like do on value or anything like that you can just you can just directly get those get those values and it will implicitly set up binding so that the next time the stream changes it will update the value in the page so with that um, again let's try to set up a basic canjs application for the most part you should just have in JavaScript, you're going to have a view model. I'm going to give a few, a lot of hints right now. You're going to have a view model, but you want to create a, a pro constant property for the amount, and then you want to make this a stash template. Um, and if you don't know that, I can give another hint, but that is in the beginner guide. Uh, make this a stash template that you render with this view model, and this view model should have an amount property that is... Well, you could put in a thousand, but make that a, a, a streaming, uh, a constant uh, property stream instead. So we'll go for like three minutes on this, and then we'll move to the next, the next section. Um, we are going to call the view payment view. I will give one more hint too. So to make a template of something, you can add a script tag. Give it type text stash and give it an ID. This is how you can have a uh, some. This allows you to basically make text rather easy in HTML of, a, of that's uh, that can be read as inter and interpreted as a template, and then you can read a template with can stash from. And that will be your, your view. We're given a lot of a lot of clues because mostly I want people focused on the um, mostly I want people focused on the uh, what's it called part the streaming parts. So I will find a timer for three minutes and we'll resume when that's done. And please stop me if there's any questions that anybody has.
All right, that's a nice little hourglass. Um, okay, so one thing I realized, I've, I, uh, the solutions are all posted. Um, and I noticed this is, again, the first time I'm going through this guide. I noticed that I called it app view, even though I said it was payment view up above. So I'm gonna change it to app view. Um, okay, so this is gonna load the app view. Uh, and we're going to want to render it with our view model. So I can render that to a document fragment with our view model. And then I can add that fragment to the body. And we'll see our page. Um, I'm also going to get rid of the invalid card for now. And then the final thing is I actually wanted to do the streaming bits. So this is where I was going to use kefir dot uh, constant. So that my amount property of my view model is going to be a constant stream that just emits a thousand and then never emits anything else again. And to show that, I can use stash curly braces to write my amount dot value. And I get back that pay a thousand. Are there any questions? Mm. No. I just have the green minty screen. I think I missed the. You might have forgotten the loading app view. Also, it's good to always have your console because you might have errors open um make sure you have app view app view to load yeah, your view. A, a syntax it was in the console yeah pro tip cool yeah always good to have if you if you discover problems have your developer tools open and if you want to um actually investigate the uh J this iframe right here that's actually running the js bin You've got to go find it, which is this one, JSBin. And now I can actually look at my view model. Um, I can look at its amount, which is going to be a stream. And here I could do something like um, 
I can say on value. And this would emit the value of the model. Or sorry, the, of the amount property. Thousand. There's also just if you're ever using Kepper streams, there's a nice uh, log. Function that you can call that will log any time the value changes and when it ends. Okay, so let's do the next next step. I have a question. Um, do we need to uh, include any other libraries? Because my Kefir is undefined. You need to make sure that Kefir is there. It should be in a script tag. Right, but when I cloned it, that should be it, right? There isn't an extra step. No. Hmm. Okay. As long as you have these script tags, everything should should work. Yeah, okay. You can actually get rid of the Stripe one, too. That one's not necessary. Is Kepper undefined for you in the console or in the JSBin JavaScript tip? In the console. Okay. Maybe you, you just clicked on the wrong console. Did you pick the right console like I was showing? You have to pick the one with... Uh, Neither one says JSON output. Into the console, it's just. Oh, just saying up. it that here. Yeah. Did you close your template tag, your template script tag? Oh, maybe that's it. Yep, there we go. Perfect. Sweet. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for uh, debugging. I'm sure other people might have had that same problem. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we want to uh, allow users to be able to enter a card number, like one, two, three, four, you know, essentially four groups of four numbers uh, separated by dashes. Um, and what we're going to want to do is, what I want to do is also process that card number um, and then spit both the user entered card number and the processed card number back at someone. So really what I'm going to want is something like user card number. And I'm going to want to do some something here. All right, well, that, it's not going to look exactly like that. And then we're going to want to have like the actual card number, like the processed card number. And, and, and another, uh, another thing like that. Let me get rid of this because that doesn't matter now. So I want to read whatever the user is typing and then output both of those, um, what they've actually typed and what we've, we've basically removed all of the dashes, essentially. So yeah, read the card number entered by the user, print it back, and also print back the cleaned up card number, the entered number with no dashes. So. The first thing that uh, we're going to be using quite a bit is this Kefir emitted emitter property object or a function that is added by CanJS. And what it does is it creates a kind of a one two punch. Once you under, if you, if you understand streams, streams have an emitter in, internally. Uh, if you create a stream through Kefir, you uh, well, we can actually show what that looks like. Normally, if you create a stream from Kefir, you have, it's kind of like when you create a promise, where you, when you make a promise, you get a callback function that you can get resolve and reject with. With Kefir, you get a callback function, you get an emitter, and then you can emit values um, and then, or errors. Now, Promises are like this, but promises, like at least in jQuery, have deferreds. And deferreds are kind of a combination of promise and also the functions that do the resolve and the rejection. CanJS, because that's so convenient uh, of an object to pass around, and especially because what we're going to want to do is connect a, essentially a streaming sync. What I mean by that is like, we, we want to hook up whatever someone's typing here to being able to write to the emitter of a stream. 
And because those are such a convenient thing to want your stream and your promise or your stream and your emitter together so often, uh, CanJS creates this emitter property function on Kefir. And what that does is essentially creates a property, uh, a streamable property that you can listen to when it changes, but it also adds an emitter onto it. You can directly access its emitter. So you can call emit either value, or you can. there's also an emit function that does the same thing. They're aliases. I'm just showing the value function here. So here I can create a property that retains its value, a stream that retains its value. And then I can say, your value is now 20, and your value is now 30. So this can be really useful to accept whatever the user is typing in this card number. The next thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to get, we're, we're going to have to hook up this input element to the, um, to a stream, a streamable property. And then we're going to need to map all of that, whatever they've entered, including the dashes, to a card number that doesn't have the dashes. For that, Kefir has a map method that allows you to take the values emitted by a stream and then map them to another stream. So we've already seen this a little bit, uh, but now I'm going to show how often people write out streams. So here we can say the source stream is it going to emit a one after a little bit, then two a little bit later, then a three a little bit later, then end. The result stream would emit a two a little bit later, a three a little bit later, and a four a little bit later, and then end. Now, because the source is a property, it's actually going to be always admitting a one. Well, sorry, in the case of like an age here, it'd always be admitting 20 until 30 was, um, was set as the value. There is no kind of, the value is not transient with properties. So that's all we really need to know about streams. The next thing we need to know about is, is actually CanJS. Because we want to be updating the stream on every character that someone writes, we want to be listening to the input event. But CanJS now has a nice new syntax that is kind of part event listener, part binding. And this allows you to listen to the input event, but send the input's value to whatever is on the right, right? So if we had, um, just like we, we can actually write to an emitter property's value with using this syntax as long as that's the key value. So we could use value to, which would only run on change, but we could use on input value to, that would run you know, on every time the input changes and update some emitter properties value. So with that, try to figure out how to create, I'll, I'll give you the names of the properties that we'd wanna create. I thought maybe we did that. Uh, let me, they are gonna be, um, the numbers that we're actually gonna wanna print, the, the streams that we'll want on our view model will be a uh, user card number. Will be some kind of thing. Some kind of, some kind of stream. And then we're gonna need to derive the actual card number, which would, which would actually be the view model uh, card number is equal to some kind of thing as well. The card number needs to derive from the user entered card number. So let's put five minutes on the board and give that a try.
And if anybody has any questions during this time, totally appropriate time to ask. You've got user C in there, but it's supposed to be user card number, right? Yes. User card number and a little bit more. All right, uh, any questions before I get started? All right, let's take a look at how to get this to work. So the first thing I need to do is for the user card number, I need one of those writable syncs, right? Like I need a place to start emitting values on, a stream that I can emit values on. Well, for that, I have this handy Keffer emitter property. Um, so with that, I can output its value. And now I should be able to start writing things out, but it is not working. Does this work for other people? Well, maybe it's just not. Sometimes you need a little kick in the pants. Oh, because I didn't actually set up the binding. Um, yeah, so, okay, I got the property there. I'm displaying it but I'm not actually writing to it. For that, I need to, uh, it's indented so much. For that, I'm gonna use that trick that we showed, which is the, um, I'm gonna get rid of this on is error. We'll bring that back later. I'm gonna use that on input, on the input event. I wanna send the value of this input to the value of the user card number. Now with that, I should be able to type, and you can see the numbers showing up there, whatever I type in, you know, that, that's the last admitted property value of the user card number, property stream. Okay, so now I need this card number to work. Um, for that, I'm gonna map the user card number to a, more space here, I'm gonna map the user card number, which is, which could be, I'll just call it card, to the value I want for the card number. Now it looks like I have a syntax error or something. You modeled that user card number. Thank you. So 
So my current number is there, but if I do its value, it's gonna be empty right now because we're essentially mapping it to undefined. Now the card, of course, could be empty itself. Uh, so I'm just gonna check is like, if we have a card, then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna return the card, but without any uh, dashes or any spaces. So either of those, that's a regular expression for that. The global will match it multiple times. I'm gonna replace uh, every any spaces or dashes with the empty string. And with that, now I should be able to have my user card number and my card number match until I put a dash in. All right, so we're doing a little bit of processing on the input to get it into a shape that we actually like. Any questions there? Okay, cool. All right, so, and make sure you ask questions because if, if, you, if you do have a question then, or you need some more explanation, it's almost certain someone watching will have the same question. Uh, so let's output the card number next. So, or the card error next, sorry. So what we're gonna wanna do is show up where we have these, these things right here. We're gonna wanna show the error of the card. Um, let me scroll that part. Okay. So yeah, if someone enters a card number, we, we wanna show a warning about what they need to enter for the card number. Uh, and then the error should also go away if the card number is 16 characters. So what we need to know is one, if we, we wanna, we're gonna create an a card error uh, stream essentially, and we're gonna want to display it inside of a div with class message. So for that, I can already show, we, we just wanna get rid of, we wanna get rid of this that we just wrote and we're just gonna have this card error sit inside of a message div. Now we've got to implement a card error. Well, we can validate a card with this function, which we'll actually just put inside of our JS bin. This, this validates a card. So given a, uh, a card, it checks that, well, if there isn't one, it's gonna give you a, it, it will return there is no card. And if it's not 16 characters, uh, it'll complain there should be 16 characters in the card. So you can use this validate card function to implement the card error property. Or card error, uh, the card error property on the view model, which is a stream property. <laughs> this is kind of confusing terms. I don't like the terms properties for streams because it conflates with properties on objects, but that's what they call it, so I'm sticking with it. So for this one, this one's basically just a rehash of what we just did. So we'll, we'll, go, uh, we'll go two and a half minutes for this one.
cool. Uh, okay, so let's see how to implement this. Um, oh, as we go through the rest of this guide, there's gonna be a bunch of little helper functions that are just essentially provided. Uh, so those will all be in this little helper function section. This part is relatively easy. Again, I just wanna take my card number, whatever, whatever it's emitted, and essentially I can just run it through this validate card function. Um, and this will just check and return whatever the card error should be. So the solution to this is relatively, like I said, simple. Uh, view model, I'm gonna make my card error property, and I'm gonna make it so that it's just the, uh, a mapping of the card number, map through the validate card. function. So now we see there is no card. As I start typing, eventually if I hit 16 characters, it'll go away. And if I have more than 16 characters, it'll come back. Any questions about this? All right. Let's keep on rocking. So the next thing we're gonna do is only, and this is the, the second hardest part of what we'll do today, uh, only show the card error when blurred. Right, so what, what we want is, and also remember there's the, uh, as part of this, there's also the class is error that we're, all, we're gonna wanna add. So we're gonna want the card error this message to only be present when they're uh, when someone has blurred at least once, and we also are going to have this class name that we're going to want to tack on only when someone has at least blurred and there is an error. So only when someone has blurred and there is an error do we actually want to um, you know show this message and add this class is error. So the way that we're going to do this is, um, I'll, I'll come back to how you can do emitter property stuff, but um, the crux to this is we're going to use the event reducer pattern to accomplish this. And this is a really super, super useful pattern. Um, Redux is mostly based around it. Um, and on a, on a high level, it's you, you, you make your streams produce events, and then you use those events to continually update a stateful object. Uh, so let's see a very small, like kind of silly example that could actually be done a different way, more simply, but uh, we can do it with the event reducer pattern, which I, I think is an easy way of understanding the reduce, uh, event reducer pattern. So and this is to combine a first and last stream into a full name value. So here I've got a first stream that's gonna produce Justin and then Ramya. This is for first names that are gonna be emitted. That was actually a pile of my wife. Oh, she's not in here calling, I'm sure, about Ramya Meyer. Um, the, so it's going to emit Justin and then Ramya. So you can imagine with time, it's going to emit Justin, and then a little bit later, it's going to emit a Ramya. And then for last, it's going to emit a Shaw. This, I've delayed an extra 50 milliseconds this one. So it's going to start emitting, but the real last is going to start at 150 milliseconds. Shaw is going to come out, and then another 100 milliseconds later, Meyer is going to come out. So the underlines are just to like space things accordingly. Um, I probably could use space, but anyways, that's that's essentially what's just going to happen. Uh, is Justin is going to be produced, then Shaw on last, then Ramya on first, and then Meyer on last. Sorry, Justin, the delay is just at the beginning of that second stream. It doesn't just delays the start of the stream, basically. Well, it's essentially it it this is going to be producing those events immediately, but then it's going to make another stream that is listening on this source stream that delays everything 50 milliseconds. Okay, cool. 
So last is is, is just going to have Shaw and Meyer de delayed uh, 150 milliseconds. Started at 150 milliseconds. So what you do typically is if you, if you just have values, in this case, these are just the first and last values being admitted. What you do is you kind of promote these values streams to event-like streams, event-like objects with a map. So what I could do is I can map first to an event-like object that has the type of the event is first, and the value is whatever it would be you know, Justin, and then it would emit a object with type first, Ramia, right? So that's, I've kind of got it listed here just in small. It's going to, first events is going to produce a type first object and then another type first object, but the value is going to be Justin and then Ramia here. And then last, we're going to do the exact same thing with, but it's going to be type last. So we're going to have last events is producing these two type last events, but with values Shaw and Meyer. All right, so now I've promoted these things that they look like events. By look like events, I mean there's some kind of distinguishing feature, uh, which would be on kind of all events coming in to the reducer, which we'll see in a second, all have a type that allows you to know kind of what happened. So a first uh, was omitted or a last was, uh, was changed. Because you need, you'll need to distinguish between was it, you know, uh, just the, you know, if we just merged these streams, we would just see the string Justin and see the string Shaw, we would know which one's first, which one's last. So that's why you're promoting these to a look like event like objects. So then the next thing you can do is the uh, next thing you do is you merge those event streams into a single stream. So what's going to happen is now I'm going to get a stream of a type first event, which would be Ramia, then a type last event, which would be type Shaw, or sorry, it's going to be type first Justin, then type last Shaw, then type first Ramia, then type last Meyer, right? So the events are now just going to like be all smashed together and one after the other in this merge stream is going to produce those. So you can use Kepper merge to do that. Then the final thing you do is you can reduce these values based on a previous state. So I'm actually going to show it this way, which I think is a more common structure. There's a shorthand that I'm doing up here. Um, so I'm going to take that merge, which is producing these events, right? Um, it's producing these first uh, type first, type last events with the, the corresponding value. And I'm going to have my previous value, my previous state. And I'm keeping track of the state, which is like essentially the last first value and the last last value. I'm, I'm going to track that. So the previous state is always going to be passed, but the first time an event is emitted, it's going to get this value passed to it. And then what I'm going to do is, depending on whether it was a first event or a last event, I'm going to take the previous data, clone it, that's this object assign, and then overwrite its first property to be whatever the event value was. Or I'm going to do the same thing and overwrite the last. And then if I didn't get a case that I knew, I'm just going to return the previous state and just leave the state alone. Why do you have to clone it? That's, I, I don't have to, but I'm being good. I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not making any uh, mutations totally imperative code, or um, a declarative code. You don't have to, but it's cool. If I, all, this is what all the cool kids in JavaScript are doing now, and if you want to be cool like them, you can do it this way. I tend to be an extremely pragmatic matic person, and uh, I think that changing state isn't actually, tracing state is, yes, uh, uh, something that is tricky and can be hard to do. But mutating state in something like this, I've never really been burned too hard. Maybe like a long time ago, but I've got a lot of good techniques on how to find where things are changing now. So I don't, I don't think it's that big of a deal. But a lot of people do, so they won't do that. Another shorthand way you could do it is I could just copy the previous state with object assign and then just send... Just because I know I'm kind of being, you know, 
sneaky here a little bit. I know my event type is either going to be first or last, and that's the property that I want to change. Well, I could just I could just do, use this shorthand like this. So what's going to happen is both of these two code do the same thing. What state is going to look like now? The state that I'm trying to maintain is going to have first, then it's going to be empty because the first event coming in is the it's going to be like Justin promoted to an event. So we're going to have first Justin, and then there's going to be nothing on last because we didn't update it. And then the last uh, event type will be uh, entered, will be um, handled. The, will kind of be, um, this function will be called back with the last type value Shaw. So then it'll, the next thing that state will emit is an object like this. And then Ramia will come in and it'll emit this. And then Meyer will come in and it will emit this as the object. So then finally, once I have my state, well, what I really wanted was just the full name value. So it's the, the final thing then is I have to, I can map that state to the actual value that I care about. So here I can take the state and I'll and map it to a state first plus state dot last and then get out full name that looks like this. And notice if you wanted here, you could be a little bit smarter. If you wanted it so that there wasn't a full name until you had both first and last, well, you could check to make sure that you had a, both a first and a last property before you did this. Um, so you can still, this, this pattern has, this pattern, I would say, there's other ways of doing things, but I would say this is probably like, you can fall back to this pattern and accomplish a whole lot of transformations of streams with this event reducer pattern. But I did note, and we'll use it later, that full name could be derived a little bit more simply from Kefir combine. We'll use combine later, and we'll talk about it then. Um, so what else you need to know is if you don't, if you wanted, let's say, on an, an event, on click, to, it, to add, uh, to essentially emit a value on one of those emitter properties, you can do it like this. You can either do it with two-way binding if you've got a value you're kind of exporting. But in this case, what you want is really on blur, you want, you're going to want to have a property. I guess I'll give the names of the properties that we're going to create. In this case, it's going to be a user card number blurred. We're going to want to emit a true when the input is blurred. So we'll have a, a user card number blurred you'll have to kind of use this technique for. So let me give as much of the pseudo code as, as I dare, um, just to let people kind of know what they're going to be creating. So there's going to be a user card number blurred, and that's going to look maybe like an emitter property, a place where you can actually write values to. And then we're going to have a show card error. Which needs to derive somehow from the user card number blurred and the card error. So we're going to have a helper function that will call show only when blurred once, which is essentially going to take these two streams. It's going to take the card error stream. and the, uh, the user card number blurred stream on the view model. And it's essentially going to return a stream that emits true or false when you should show the card error. Essentially, you can think of it this way. Um, we are going to essentially ignore the card error if the, uh, the user has never blurred. So if the user is never blurred, then this is always going to be false. But if the user has blurred, then we're going to essentially, uh, if th the card error is true, then we're gonna, it, it, there's something in the card error. There is a card error value. It's going to be show card error should be true. And if there's not, then it's not. So in some ways, it's like a this 
comes first and then this kind of comes second. So we put that in the helpers. So what you'll want to do is down in these helpers, I created a show only when blurred once and that takes an error stream and a blurred stream because we're going to use this for all of the other um, input elements. So this one is a doozy. So we'll give 10 minutes for this one. Give it, give it a try. And if there's any questions, just, just let me know. If the Batovi folks finish early, uh, give me a thumbs up or something on, uh, on Slack or if I can see your face, do it there.
Yeah, so the tokens, I put a, uh, in Slack, in general, a thumbs up when you were done message that you can thumbs up when you were done. Justin, is there a a mistake in like the the shorthand version of the the reduce that you're showing? It should return back the copy, right? See that here. Hey, Kevin, can you repeat your question? Sorry, I was getting water. That's fine. Uh, I was just saying, I think there's a an error in like the shorthand of the reducer that you show. I think it's it needs to return back the, the copy object. Yeah, this this one. Yeah, it for sure needs to return back the copy object. Okay, cool. I was just making sure. So I yeah. copied that copy object and it didn't work. Listen, for debugging, is there a way that I can check my merge stream? Like, you can just merge use on that value? log. That log method that I showed, if you remember that. On any. I don't remember that. Yeah, in any one of these streams, you can just do dot log, and then it will. Uh, you can check the. It'll log any values it gets. Okay. So you can see them, and then you can pass it as the first argument to log a, a name, and it will like use that name when console logging. Ah, uh, okay, thanks. 
Is log is a function? Log is a function, yeah. All right, pencils down. Uh, anybody ever get instructors who did that? No. I am. Yep. I've turned into a dad. I have no no good jokes anymore. All right. Uh, so let's okay. let's implement this. Uh, what what am I going to start with? I'm going to start with this user card number blurred, uh, and this is just going to be another Keffer emitter property, and I just want this to be true. Anytime someone blurs. So I am going to go to this input and I'm going to do the on blur. I want to call user card number blurred.emitter value and I can pass it whatever I want. In this case, I just wanted to emit a true because it's been blurred. Okay, so now I've just I've, I've kind of set up my source observables. And one, one thing you'll notice is that the view model up here, I'm pretty much got all of my source observables and then everything underneath it is the derived observables. I think there's actually a, a few better ways of organizing this code, but it was kind of my first stab at it. Um, I can talk about those at the end of this if anybody's still sticking around to, to talk theory about how to deal with streams. Uh, so now that I've got that, I need, I really need to implement this show only when blurred once. And this is, this is the tricky part. Uh, the first thing I need to do is promote the error stream, which is just going to be strings and the blurred stream, which is just going to be true or false to, uh, to actual events. So I'm going to make an error event. Which I'm going to use the error stream and map that to. I'm going to map that to an error type object. So here's going to be the actual error. And one thing to remember is a lot of these, especially when you're dealing with uh, forms and things like that, is you have to handle often there is no value, especially if you want to deal with properties. Properties might have no value. When, especially if you start listening to a property that's never been emitted on, it will have no value. So this might be one thing that as you're working on these problems, you'll encounter and you're like, oh, okay, uh, maybe now I get it. Because uh, I think when I started working on this, I, I just wanted to do something like, well, you know, uh, just, just return, uh, you know, error uh, or type error and then I, I used message for the error you might have used value it doesn't really matter I just used the, the message for the error is that and what you might want to do is just something like that but this error might be undefined or a string you always have to deal with that I don't know if you had to deal with it for this one uh, specifically you definitely do have for focus events um, just if the error didn't exist so what I'm gonna do is make sure if there isn't an error well then I'm gonna say that my um, my object is valid, so I'm going to do a type valid event. Otherwise, if there was an error, it's going to be a type error event, and there's going to be a message error. There's a lot of different ways you could uh, pr promote this error object to different types of events. These are just what I what I what I chose here. And it doesn't have to be named type. I just tend to do that because that's how CanJS's events always have a type. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a focused event. And actually, I think I call this focus events, which is probably, I'm just going to call it focus event. And this is going to be the blurred stream. It's just going to be whether 
it's focused or blurred, essentially. I'm just going to admit of, of type focused or type blurred or uh, basically a, a, no, a, no, a no op. So here's my uh, blurred stream. I'm going to map those. Again, this is just going to be an is blurred value. It's going to be tr true or uh, undefined or, or possibly false. I made it so originally if I... I toggled between true, uh, focused or blurred that this would set is blurred to true, focused would set it to false, and then it would be undefined if it didn't know what it was. So when I originally wrote this, I, I have all of those cases in mind. So if is blurred is equal to undefined, that means we've never actually written to this. So I'm just going to say that nothing has happened, right? This is kind of a no-op event. There is no type. And then if it was blurred, I'm going to make an event of type blurred, or I'm going to make event of type focused. All right, so I'm promoting, hey, we just blurred or we just focused, depending if this is true or false. But if it's nothing, because we, we don't really know what the state is, we're just going to leave it as um, essentially a no-op event. Okay, so now we have our, our error event stream and our focus event stream. And I'm going to do the, I'm going to merge those. Let me move this to the top so people can see it a little bit easier. I'm going to merge the error event and the focus event. And then I'm going to, I'm just, I'm not, I could say that as some kind of merged, like all events stream and name it as such. But instead, I'm just going to scan it right away, call the scan method, uh, which again gets called with the previous state and the event that whatever was uh, emitted, the, the whatever was emitted from the stream. And here I've got to reduce my, my, to my state. And this is what I'm going to return. This is, well, I'm not going to return this exactly yet. We'll, we'll see what happens with this. So here's where I need to switch between all of my different types of events. So I'm going to switch by event type. And depending on what type, I want to do different things. Now, actually, what, before I even start switching here, I'll actually try to figure out what is the state that I really need to track. That's a really important thing. Like what? What do I need to track? Because at the end of this, I want to know, should we show the card error? Right? And that card error, whether we should show the card error or not, right? So that's definitely a value that I want. Like, show card error. Right? So that, that's going to be false to start. But to, to know that, I need to track some other state, which, which is, have we been blurred? We'll say it's false to start, and is the card valid? Now, in reality, I could just track these two states, um, and then later on from these two states derive whether show card error. But for me, it's just, I don't know, it was just nice to have show card error there. Probably maybe a, a better solution would not to be to have it and just derive it from these two states in the next step. But I'm going to drive all three of these states um, kind of at the same time. So here, uh, I'm going to have my case cases. So if my event type was valid, was, uh, was just produced, that means, hey, our card is valid. Uh, we want to, basically, we, 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 are, we want to retain the old states, um, the previous states. Uh, whether it's been blurred or not, but everything else, uh, show card error should be false and is valid should be true. So what I'm going to do is that same way of copying my object. I'm going to do an object assign of the previous state to a new object, to clone it essentially. And then I'm going, and this the, you know, there's new operators in, in ES6 that can make this even nicer, but I'm not going to do those right now. Um, and if it's valid, I always want the if is valid to prop state to be true. 
I want the show card error to be false. And the has been blurred will be whatever it was previously. So there's case valid. I'm also going to want case invalid. So now our card has just become invalid. Well, what do we want these values to be? Well, it's almost the same thing. Just a little bit uh, is valid. Well, no, our card is no longer valid. But should we show the error? Well, this really depends on the previous state. If the previous state has been blurred. If has been blurred is true, then we want to show the card error. If has been er blurred is false, then we do not want to show the card error. So what I'm going to just use is the previous has been blurred. And that's all I need for, for this case. And then finally, I want blurred. Now we've just blurred the input element. So we're going to do something rather similar. We are going to, in this case, we're, we're going to leave the validity, whatever it was. In this case, we're really going to be setting the has been blurred to true because it's just been blurred. Now for show card error, this is kind of the opposite of this. It's based on whether our card was valid. So if our card is not valid, then we want to show the card error. So if the previous state was had a not was not valid, then we want to show the card error. And the final case is just to handle default, which we're just going to return the previous state. Any questions there so far? All right. So now that we have, um, we've reduced and we're maintaining this state, right? We've done our event reducer. The final thing is we need to get out the actual should we show the card error value. So that is pretty simple. I'm just going to take this state objects that are being emitted every time. So I can call this state. And I'm just going to return the states show card error. So now we have this, should we show the card error, right? We have this show card error uh, value that we can use in our view that we just derived. And to use that, I'm going to use stashes if we should show the card error. We've got to always read the value from the stream. If we should, then show this div. And then similarly, we'll have, I'm just going to kind of copy and paste it from the solution to keep things moving here. We want something just like it, which is if we show the card error, then we should have this class is error. So there's one final thing that we need to do, and it's kind of non-obvious, which is there's this weird way we can, um, so here if we blur, oh, hold on a second, I might have created a bug. And I have a bug. property type of undefined. That is not going to help me, is it? My guess, oh, it's because there is no event? No, there has to be an event. Hold on. We have to have an event because, hold on, I got to see where that error is coming from. Maybe it wasn't there. Maybe it's okay. So let's try to debug this. Actually, I think I know the error. The error is that I'm not returning anything. Well, that was part of it. <laughs> um, 
So one good way of doing this whenever you encounter a problem is to use that log, right? So here I can get the merged. I can save that. I've got my um, state. And then I've got my final value that's being returned. And I can see using log state dot log should be able to see what the state is. So show card error, one, two, three. Blur has been blurred, you'll notice, is still false. Why is that? So I, I wish I logged the events going into this too, but the last thing should have been a blurred event. And show card error is valid, should have been false. Show card error should have been set to true. But it wasn't because I didn't return anything here. Boom. <laughs> I debugged my own problem. OK, so now we have uh, 16 characters. OK, that works great. Now, there's one still weird, subtle problem is that um, I'm actually forgetting how to see this. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, okay. And then if you remove and then click away, oh, it didn't show up. Why is the error, why is, uh, why is the error not, not uh, showing, right? Does anybody have any idea? I, I bet no one does. That's a weird bug. Nope. Let me, go ahead. I was just saying nope. OK, so but hopefully you recognize what the bug is, right? The bug is is we just don't remove the card number, but yet um, it's not showing the error, even though we've blurred, right? Now, this is a problem because what's happening is the card error is losing. Remember how we talked about how um, values kind of can disappear, right, if they're just a normal stream? This is the problem, is that as the, as if the sh show card error becomes falsy, the card error is no longer bound anymore. And then Stash isn't trying to retain its value, and the prop, because it's a stream, because card error is just a normal stream, it doesn't retain its error, so no error is shown. So this is where you want to keep things as properties. This is why you need to keep this to property. And then it fixes this problem, right? So uh, one, 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 ah, well, it should go away. Okay. And I did something wrong. Hold on. I can figure out what went wrong here. I wonder if it was because of that visa thing. Okay. And then if I delete, why is delete not? Okay. Let's check our state again. Might have had something else go wrong. You do need those is properties to make sure that you're retaining the value of, of everything. I might need another one somewhere. So let's see here. Show card error is false. Is valid true? It is not valid. Why does it think it's valid? So let's see here. Show card error. We can do a log on that. Okay. Not show card error. I wanted it on the card here. Oh, 
Okay, so as we type, we should see the blur. Make sure we're seeing our card error. Should be 16 characters in the card. It should go away. Card error became undefined because there is no error. And then as we delete, so card error still exists, notice. And it's still going between 16 characters and not 16 characters. But is valid is still staying true, which is a problem. So let's figure out what happened there. Okay. So really what's happening is our card is becoming invalid here. We really should be hitting this case. I wonder if we're not. So we can do on the error event. Hopefully everybody is enjoying this uh, tutorial on debugging problems with streams as much as I am enjoying doing debugging this live. Is, is it that you've got a type valid, but you're looking for a type invalid? Yes, that is type error. Yes. That is exactly it. I was supposed to be type invalid up here. Thank you. This should be type invalid. That is exactly it. Well, hopefully, if nothing else, everybody got a good uh, look into how I debug these issues by putting those logs in place and seeing. And the nice thing about it is you can kind of see where things went wrong. You can see what the values emitting are. You can see what the source values are. And you can eventually work your way towards um, you can eventually work your way towards the solution. Working. I delete. Okay, so now it's working. But, and then also cut and paste works too, which is what I wanted. Oh, it's not. Why did it still look like it left some of the the class name? And okay, that was right. Why didn't it work that first time? Three, four. It's blur. That works. It's blur. That works. Cop, cut, paste. Good works. Okay, maybe it was just. Maybe I didn't save right. Okay, looks like it's working now. Hooray! But that's that's so to get it to work, that error that I was talking about, you do need that property thing because especially with can't stash as bindings, like once it loses card error and then suddenly it needed to show the card error, it wouldn't be present because it wasn't a property, so it wasn't retaining its values. That to property makes sure that it's gonna retain the value. Um uh you know, it's, it's, it's actually kind of cool. It's going to retain the value as long as it's bound, but be, it is bound card error because essentially show card error is bound to it. But you need to be able to immediately read the value from it, which is what to property enables. So no matter what, card error, whether it's a property or stream, is bound. Right? Uh, because it's, it's show card error is always being looked at by stash, so it's always being listened to. The problem is, even though it's bound and it's, it, uh, show card error is using that as a stream to get new values, when stash suddenly is like, okay, we need to render a card error, um, the value won't be there because it's a stream, but the value will be there if it's a property. So just remember that. That was like a uh, kind of a hang up for me for a little bit to figure out how to get this working is I really need to conceptualize the difference between streams and properties and when to use which. Cool. All right. So the next two parts are pretty easy. Um, and I'll, we'll just do a little bit of, of time for those because we've already gone way longer than I thought. Um, so the next thing is to just do the same thing, but with the expiry, and then we'll also do it with the uh, with the CVC number. So the expiry, the only thing that we're gonna do here is um, expiry should be entered like with a dash, 
but we're going to want to save the expiry on the view model as an array with strings inside of it. So it's going to be the exact same code for the most part. We're just going to have a We're we're just gonna have a um, we're just gonna have a, uh, a we're just gonna have instead a, a few different properties. We're gonna have the user expiry. We're gonna have the user expiry blurred that we're gonna have to wire up, and then we're going to do something very similar to what we did with the card number, almost identical. The only difference is it's going to be for the expiry. And then the properties are going to be a uh, view model dot expiry for the actual expiry, which again should be saved as an object with like two strings, like 12, uh, 17 or something. And then there'll be a view model expiry error and a view model expiry. Show expiry error. And then here's the validate expiry helper that you can just use. And you can just to, to create the expiry from whatever the user entered, you can just split on dash. And that's good enough. So I'm just going to paste the expiry helper right here. And that should give everybody enough to get going. So we'll do, this should be really fast. Um, so we'll do like three minutes for this, and then I'll go through the solution.
All right, so let's see how the expiry uh, can be made to work. It's just like the car number. We're going to have a, uh, a writable stream, a, a emitter property for the uh, expiry. And then we're also going to have one for whether the user has been blurred. The hookup for this is going to be just like pretty much the exact same thing. Um, but I'll hook it up later. Instead, I'm going to do all of the view model stuff. So I have my, my user expiry, which I'm going to be writing to from this input element. And I have the, um, uh, and I have this expiry, which I want to, I want to derive from this user expiry. So the way to do that is pretty simple. I'm just going to map the, uh, view model source user expiry stream. I'm going to map that to um, that, uh, a, an array, essentially, that contains both parts. So I'm just going to check if there was an expiry. If there was, I'm going to return the expiry with dashes uh, split uh, into an array. So that part's pretty easy. The error, I'm just going to map through the validate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to essentially just copy this code right here that just runs it, the expiry through a map function. And I'm just going to run it through the validate expiry function that I pasted below. So instead of validate card, I'm going to map it through this validate expiry. One thing I like about this is that these functions are all very static right now, that they're pretty easily unit testable. And then I'm going to, I need to implement this show expiry error. And for that, again, it's just going to be the same code I had up here, except instead of the card, um, instead of based on the card number, it's going to be based on the expiry. So I'm going to send the expiry error, and I'm going to send if the user expiry is blurred. And this will just produce a similar stream that's true or false, but this time based on the expiry error um, and the ex if the expiry is blurred. So that's all I've had to do in my view model. Now let's hook it up. And hook it up. It's going to be the exact same thing. Copy all of this. I just need to change the names of everything. So instead of user card number blurred, I'm going to be writing to the user expiry blurred. Um, instead of sending the input's value to the user card number, I'm going to send it to the user expiry. And in, whether I should show it or not is going to be the show expiry error. And then I need one of these for the expiry error. And I will be showing the expiry error. And with all of that, I should be able to it works. Let's delete. Yay. It works. Awesome. OK, I'll assume there's no questions. Um, so let's go on to the next, next part. So the next part, um, we're going to do the exact same thing with the CVC. Uh, so in, in the case of the CVC, it's it's all of the same. The only difference is uh, you need this validate CVC helper to validate the CVC, and you need the uh, the CVC itself uh, can is just can be whatever the user entered. If you want to clean it up, you can, but I, I didn't actually clean it up. So in in this case, the properties that we're going to be creating, there's going to be a user CVC, 
a user CVC blurred. And down here on the view model, there's going to be a view model CVC, a view model CVC error, and a view model show CVC error. Now, as I said before, we don't need to do any cleanup of the CVC, so we can just treat that as the view model user CVC. So we don't need to do any cleaning up. You can just, I just set CV, the CVC property to be the same stream as the user CVC. And then just make sure you have your validate CVC. So this one again is, is really easy. We'll do another, we'll just do two minutes for this one. And let me know if there's any questions. I just realized I forgot to hit the start button. So let's just do it now if nobody um, has an issue with that. No issue. No issue? <laughs> uh, did you get it working? Uh, and the, the final example works. <laughs> the final example? But the, what about the CVC one? Uh, well, I'm. I'm just kind of looking at the final example. Yeah, I'm a little bit okay. over my head. OK, so uh, what we're going to do is um, we need to create this error, right? So people are typing in the CVC number. We need to translate that to an error. I'm just going to run it through the validate CVC function. Uh, and this is just like what we everything we've done before. So where is our error? I'm just going to use the CVC value. I'm going to map that through validate CVC. And that will produce the CVC error. So as the user's typing, the CVC error value will change. The stream will change. And now we need the show CVC error. This is going to be use the exact same logic as we were using before. And this is going to be the show only when blurred once. Uh, and, but in, instead of the expiry error, it's going to be the um, CVC error. And instead of when the uh, CV, uh, expiry is blurred, it's going to be the CVC is blurred. And then, of course, we need these.
two emitter properties again, and then we're going to do this final. Uh, we're going to update the page correspondingly. So we're going to the CVC input. We're just going to do the same thing we were doing up here, except it's going to be with the CVC. I'm just kind of pasting it to save a little bit on time. And here we're just doing the same thing. We're on the inputs value, we're updating the user CVC value. And then on blur, we're just going to emit a true on the user CVC blurred stream. And then, of course, up above, we need the if we should show a CVC error, then we're going to put up this div with the CVC error. So with all of that, now I should be able to put in the CVC error, and it will not work. Um, let's see why. Well, one thing is sometimes cut and paste just does mess things up here. So let's just make sure it's actually running here. OK, so it is working. All right, so now uh, the next part, we are going to disable the pay button if any part of the card has an error. Uh, for this, we're going to use Kefra's Combine. This is what I said earlier could make it easier to uh, derive a, val a, a, a value from other values. We could have done first and last with just this. So here, if I had first and last, uh, Kefir combine uh, those same streams that produce first names and last names, Kefir combine would result in this. It's going to wait till an event has been produced on both source streams and then call back this combine function to take those values and then return what should be emitted on the resulting stream. So with that, um, I'm going to give just one minute for people to do this, and then I'm going to go on uh, because I think we're heavily, heavily over time. OK, so for this one, we're going to create an is invalid card property. And we're going to use that. So we're going to derive that from a whole bunch of other values. But we're going to use that to disable this pay button here on the left. So this pay button, we want it disabled. So we can use can't stash as bindings. I want to disable the disabled value of the button from the is invalid card value, right? The value, the last emitted value of that stream. So is invalid card. Okay, so is invalid card, we can use the combined function of Kefir. To say if this card is invalid. So what we want to combine is really the errors to know whether there's errors in all of the other cards. So I'm just going to do my view model that card error, my view model expiry error. 
in my view model um, CVC error. So if I have all of those, if any one of them are erring, I know that, um, that my card is invalid. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the arguments to keep things moving. So here, card error, expiry error, CVC error, if any of those are true, I know there's a problem. So I'm going to return, I'm gonna see if any one of them are true. I'm just gonna copy this, some ors between it. If any of these emitted a true, uh, a truthy value, that means we have an error. I want to convert this to a Boolean, so I'm gonna use that double not, that just, you know, knots it, but then knots it again, so it turns it into a true. And now this is my, uh, now you can see here, my, my thing is disabled, my form is disabled. Hold on, I got a blur here. I think it went too many characters. Okay. Now it's enabled. Hooray! Okay, so now the, the second hardest part of this guide, which is how to make an Ajax request to create a payment. Uh, and what we want to do is simulate an Ajax request. We're just going to create a promise that resolves in two seconds uh, like this. We'll just use this to kind of simulate uh, an Ajax request being made. But while that's happening, we want the pay button to say paying $1,000 instead of pay. So really what we're going to need is and at the at the end of the day what, what i really want is i want on my view model a payment status property that is going to admit uh so this is going to be a stream of status objects and i want this to basically emit objects that look like either status waiting or uh, status resolved, right? So while what I want is to like click this button and this, I wanna make it so it makes an Ajax request, but based on the clicks, right? Basically I'm gonna emit a true to say like, hey, we, we click something. Um, what I mean by that is I'm gonna have this pay clicked. Let me give people some hints here. I wanna have a play, pay clicked uh, Kefir property that just emits a true anytime we want the pay click button has been clicked and we want to make the Ajax request. And while the Ajax request is going out, we want, um, we want payment status to be true. So this is really tricky to get payment payment status uh, to be, to be the status waiting and emit status resolved when it's done. This is really the hardest part. So some things you need to know, and then I'll give like another minute to do it. Um, mostly, so if people want to pause there, they can pause, and then I'll, I'm going to give the solution. So a few things to know. Um, well, CanJS, you can listen to, you know, we're going to listen to when the form is submitted, but here you can listen to events like this and call a method. We're going to need a method on our view model, which we'll call pay. Uh, and what this should be doing is it's going to get the event. It needs to cancel the actual submit, uh, prevent the default behavior of the submit event. And then what it what we really are going to have it do is just submit that pay clicked. Uh, we we want it to admit a um, an emitter a true. So this is how we're going to get it. We're essentially when someone clicks the form, we want to prevent default, and we also want to on pay click it to admit a true. Uh, we couldn't do it the way that we did it. Uh, this way, because we needed the event to be canceled. 
So this is this is a way that can do that. We we prevent the default, send me the form, and now we can admit the true. Um, so Kefir from Promise. that can take a promise and returns a stream that resolves when the promise ends or the promise is resolved. So that can be used to take the fake promise that we'll create and then essentially create another stream. You also um, need to know about Kefir's combine. That it, We already looked at this, but it actually has passive observables. Sometimes you don't want to emit a value um, when th other things have changed. So really, what we're probably going to create is like a, 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 a stream of promises that gets emitted every time someone should pay. But that promise stream should really derive from when someone clicked on the... Oh, where did my JSPN go? Should really come from when someone's clicked, right? This pay clicked. It should derive from that. It should also derive and needs to create be able to create the promise. It actually needs the other uh, credit card data. Well, if the credit card data changes, we don't want to create a new promise. We only want to create a promise when someone clicks this pay button. So Kefir's, um, let me find that. Kefir's combine takes passive observables. And those are essentially, you can access those values, but you're not going to emit a new value when those streams emit a new value. So we're going to need that. Uh, Kefir concatenate concatenates two streams. So if I had a stream, one stream that was started producing 0, 1, 2, and another started producing 3, 4, 5, concatenate will make it so that these streams, one goes after another. It's different than merge, which like makes it so that the zero and three would be kind of, it would admit a zero, then a three. And this, it makes it so it emits all of A's and then starts emitting all of B's. And then finally is flat map. And this is where things get really crazy. Um, the way to think about flat map is it's, well, what I um, make it analogous to is how promises can flatten inner promises. Let's take a look at a quick example. So I have an outer promise here that's going to, after a brief timeout, resolve to outer. And I have an inner promise that after a brief timeout is going to resolve to inner. If I create a, if I listen to when my outer promise um, outer promise finishes and then return the inner promise. One might think if they never looked at promises before that this outer, this result promise is going to resolve when outer promise resolves with a that with a promise, which would be the inner promise, and then we'd have to listen to when that resolves ad nauseum, just like forever. But that's not how promises work. Instead, they automatically flatten, right? Result promise is actually going to resolve when inner promise resolves with the value of inner promise, right? So result, result promise, if we're listening for it, it will resolve, its resolved value will be inner. So this is kind of strange, right? Like promises automatically flatten. So a promise that kind of resolves to a promise that resolves to a promise that resolves to a promise, really you own like the outer kind of the, the thing that's returned is actually automatically flattened. It's always going to be with the innermost promises resolved. Streams don't automatically flatten. Instead, you call flatten on them, and then they flatten for you. So streams of streams get flattened. So what, let's take a look at like a little example here. So this is producing uh, 0, 1, 2. Um, that's actually count. I should have been count here. Is, is zero one uh, zero one two, and then stream of streams is really what it's doing is as zero one two is being produced, 
it's just going to make an interval and produce a 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. Let me actually show this in Kefir because I meant to update it, but I, I changed a little bit. So Kefir here is essentially there's a 0, 1, 2 being produced, and then it's going to make a stream of streams, really. Uh, it's going to make a stream of streams that each inner stream is producing a bunch of ones, and then it's producing a bunch of twos, and then producing a bunch of threes. So there's a stream. The, the stream has a, str uh, a set of streams inside of it that is producing ones, twos, and threes. Right, so it's almost like you have a promise that is returning another promise that's returning ones, and, and then that, uh, it's, it's kind of almost doing like a um, promise.all of three promises. One that's returning ones, another that's returning twos, and another is returning threes. What Flatten does is it makes it so that all of those streams are essentially flattened into a single stream, and it's essentially the, the internal streams, whatever they're emitting, becomes what the outside result stream is emitting. How is that different than merge? Merge just combines the outputs of two streams, but a stream, if you merged two stream of streams, you would still get have a stream of streams. Oh, yes, I see. That's a good question. So this is really crazy. So the idea is I'm going to I'm going to I'm just going to give a sneak peek of the answer because it's like it was hard for me to come up with on my own. It took a lot of thought. It's almost impossible in like 10 minutes to come up with. So I'm going to I'm going to explain it then give everybody a minute to like soak it in and maybe try it and then I'll give I'll kind of type it up one more time. So the idea here is I want a stream of promises first. Okay, so well, actually, before that, I need to get my card data. So I want uh, all of my card data. I'm going to use combine to make an object of my card data. Right, this is just using combine. I'll wait till my card number expiry or CVC are all omitted, and then, you know, card will have basically be an object of all of those good things. The next thing is I have a payment promise that I want to cr produce a stream of promises. That's why I kind of have this notation. I've got a stream of promises. And any time pay clicked fires, I'm going to essentially, if pay clicked is true, I'm going to map. Essentially, I'm doing a mapping to a promise. But what I wanted is the card data, right? Just so I could say, like, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to make an AJAX request with the card data. I need to be, have that available. Because in a real app, you would, you would definitely need that. So I get the pay clicked and the card. But again, this is passive. So I'm only really running this function when pay clicked changes. So anyways, I'm, I'm getting a, a stream of promises. And then what I want to do is I'm going to make a stream of streams of statuses. That's basically like the statuses down below, whether we're waiting or resolved. I'm going to map the payment promise to a um, essentially the stream of status streams. So if we had a promise, what I want is to emit essentially on the stream that I'm producing. I want to emit a pending. And then when that's done, I want to emit from that promise, I get a, um, you know, from a promise, this Kefir from promise is a stream that essentially is going to emit whatever the promise resolves to. I'm going to map whatever the promise resolves to to a status object. So essentially, I'm producing an object, and then um, uh, this, this status object. And then once the promise is done, I'm producing another status object. So I'm going to concatenate those so it produces this and then this. And that's what I'm going to return if there's a promise. I'm, so it's like a stream of those. Essentially, I'm returning a stream of those two events. And then if there wasn't a promise, we were undefined, it means we're waiting, we're kind of waiting to make a request. I'm going to essentially produce a stream of 
uh, a, a waiting status. And then the final thing is I'm going to flatten all of those into um, this payment status. So I just gave a huge tip because I gave the actual code. <laughs> that might be really hard to understand, but try to, um, where was the, I don't want to go above the solution. Um, and I'll put this up there too. Try to implement the, try to implement the payment button. Um, I'm only going to give again a minute for it before I go, just so people can pause and then resume. And the other thing is here, I want this payment stuff in here to be that status. I didn't copy it right. Let me copy the solution. So, okay. So again, this is just looking at that payment status that we're going to be trying to. Um, we're we're trying to 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 essentially go between pay clicked and this final payment status uh, stream. And we're going to be using that to see if we should be um, saying paying here or else pay. So we'll go one minute on the board. All right, so let's implement this. Um, I'm just going to mostly cut and paste and walk through it again. Uh, so the first thing is to be able to make an actual AJS request, I need my card data. So that's what this was. Right? I'm just combining the card number, expiry, and CVC all into one object with all of that information. That is probably straightforward enough. The next thing I'm going to do is I want to win essentially the is pay button, like the, the pay, uh, pay clicked is, uh, is emitted, a true is emitted. I want, I need to be able to make an Ajax request, right? So, but I also need the card data, so that's why this is in the passive uh, list of observables. So here, I'm just going to check if the pay was, if uh, pay clicked was actually true, it wasn't just undefined or some other value. Then I'm going to, um, I'm going to say, hey, we're asking for a token with this card number. And I'm going to fake a promise that resolves in two seconds. And that's what this payment promises is going to return. So one thing I like to do um, is, is definitely document what your streams are, are doing or what they're expected to return. In this case, this is a stream that's uh, emitting promises that resolve to numbers, which is like how much you just paid, or undefined. Okay, so now things get a little crazy because what I need to be able to do is have um, this payment status be as the promise is created, I need it to be emitting a pending, a status of pending. And then as it's resolved, I need it to be emitting a 
status of resolved. So this is where streams of streams can come in handy. So I'm going to make what I, I'm going to make is actually a stream of stream of statuses. And to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to call this payment status stream. I'm going to map my promises to a stream of statuses. Right, so now inside here, every promise, I just basically need to map it to a stream of the right statuses. So I'm going to check if there's a promise. Then I want to make a stream of status objects, the right ones. So the first one that I want to produce is this Keffer constant. Right, so I, I just want to say, hey, pending. Right, but then I want that followed by the, the stream for the promise, right? Where, so when the promise is resolved, I actually want it to give a status of resolved and a value of value. That's the, the status object I want for when a promise is resolved. So I need a stream that's going to emit this and then emit this. Well, that is what concat can do. It can, it can concat, we, we looked at that, concat, I can concatenate and say, hey, I want another stream that's actually going to produce whatever is in here, and whenever that's done, I want it to produce whatever is in here. So, um, Adam, you asked, hey, when would you ever want constant? Well, here's a good use case for it, which is you, you mm. want, yay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you want, um, you want essentially, uh, it works really well with streams of streams. You want some value to be produced and then maybe go on to some other values. An excellent answer. Worth waiting for. Awesome. Um, okay, so if we don't have a promise, then we're just going to say, hey, we're going to essentially, all we want is a, uh, a stream that just says we're waiting. Um, in this case, I'm just going to use a constant again that just says, um, we're waiting. So now I've got that stream. This payment status stream is it going to emit streams itself, and those streams that it emits are going to emit status objects. And what I want is the payment status stream to be the kind of inner streams. I want it to be the status pending object. I want this to be emitting the payment status object or, or this status resolved object or the status waiting object. So I can do that by uh, using payment status, status stream and using flat map. That's like, okay, go, if you find, basically, un, you know, go inside any stream that's admitted on pay, payment status, go inside and then get all of those streams and listen to those streams. And then I'll do to property because I want that payment status always to be immediately readable. And with that, we should be able to pay our bills here, folks. So let me, let me see here. And pay. Oh, no. I forgot to wire up my form. So I got to make sure my form actually calls the on submit the pay event. Now let's try it again. Good. Yay! All right. Now there's one final step, and this is an, a relatively easy one. This is we just want to disable this while someone's paying. Um, so for that, we're going to create a, um, I think it's a disable payment button, uh, pro property interview model. Uh, and that should really just derive itself from whether someone's paying or whether the card is invalid. So we already have it, uh, button 
uh, its disabled property hooked up to whether the card is invalid. We're going to hook it up to instead to the disabled pay disable payment button stream that is now going to read from both is invalid card and from the payment status. So I don't think there's anything to know. Oh, you know you need you know everything you need to know at this point. So this one is pretty easy. We'll go one more minute on this, uh, and then I'll finish up this epic um, this epic adventure we just went on. All right, so let's implement the last bit of this, this disable payment button. Um, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna combine the, um, if the card is invalid and the payment status. So let me just give myself some breathing room here. So I'm gonna use Kefir to combine both the Payment status. Um, I'll just write my agenda here. I'm going to make it combine my payment status with the uh, is card invalid. So I always like copying and pasting, so I'm going to do that. Is card invalid stream. So is card invalid with the payment status. And given both of these, I can figure out whether the card should be disabled or not. Um, so let's just think about it. Like, if the card is invalid, then, you know, yes, of course, you, you, you want to disable. And then... If there isn't a payment status yet, you only want really um, only if the payment if the payment status is anything but pending, then you want to to show, right? If it's or sorry, if it's dis if basically if it's um, if it's pending, you want it disabled. If it's un uh, yeah, if it's if it's pending, you want it disabled. Any other case, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just gonna say like, if my payment status, uh, if we have a pen payment status and the payment status is um, is pending. That we're, we're making the Ajax request we want to turn true. Um, I would say if we don't have a pending, if we don't have a payment status also, 
that that probably means we want it blocked as well, right? Like, um, well, no, I guess I think it's just if we have a payment status and it's pending, I think return true is fine. All right, so let's see if this works. I've got my is card valid. I'm gonna change that to disable payment button. We're gonna see if this thing works here. So I'm gonna paste credit card number. There we go. It should be disabled. Dang it. All right, let me make sure that it actually worked here. Get everything updated. Always good to add enter. Double check. One, two, two, one, two, three. Okay, it worked. Sweet. So, right, now it's disabled while it's paying. So, we've kind of come full circle. One thing I really like about streams um, is that, you know, there's really a lot of multi level derivations possible. Whether you disable the payment button is based on whether the card is invalid or not and the payment status, right? Um, and then the payment status comes from whether someone clicked the pay button or not, and whether the card is valid comes from all of these inputs. So it's like there's a lot of levels of derivation that eventually get to your rule for whether you should disable the payment button. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of how this is all structurally organized, the code, but there's something really nice about how um, logical it is that I can see what every value, how it derives itself, and I can trace that through my entire application. So that is really why I like streams. They are an advanced topic to be sure, but an advanced topic I believe is worth learning. Any other thoughts? All right, well, I'll go ahead. Oh, it's kind of dumb, but. I know it was way, way back, but what did the focus event do? Like, I get what the blur did. Once it blurs, it can whatever. But what did, why did you add the focus part of that? There, there was just, just a naming thing. Um, I just called it the focused event. Um, you're talking about down here? Yeah. Like, it was just focused focus event. It was just, I could have called blurred or focused events. Oh, but it's, it's just the name. Oh, sorry. But type focused, like... Did you need the focused part of that? No. No. Okay. Sorry. No, because we never actually used it. So we could have just, when blurred is true, emitted this. Otherwise, we could have just emitted this. This totally would have worked. That was me. And in reality, this is me. Like, I got it working. And then, because I actually had it emit true and then false for, um, I actually uh, originally started with a just like uh, is focused. Um, uh, emitter or stream that would be true and, and then false if not and then undefined whether like it didn't really know because you're in the application startup so that's why it had it's kind of like legacy I clean I realized I didn't have to be emitting both true and falses on that so it's just kind of like legacy I didn't clean this up okay. from when I kind of started there yeah okay that's all the reason I asked was I wasn't sure if we ever did anything with it, and I guess we didn't. So yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you everybody who is watching. Um, hopefully this was good. It was a lot longer than I thought, but this is an advanced topic. Please go through the guide. Uh, I've, I've been right now noticed a few things that I'd like to improve. There's other things, explanations that are needed. Uh, I really didn't go into a lot of depth on a lot of it. Um, I'm hoping I did link to all of Kepfer's docs, which I, I would hope you know you get a good explanation there, um, but check it out. Let us know on Kanjas's Gitter channel or on the forums if this kind of stuff is valuable to you. Until next time, take it easy. <laughs>